going on guys welcome back to another video and today we're going to be talking about the online fashion retailer boohoo and understanding why over the last five days the stock crashed by as much as 37 percent now the stock did put in a little bit of a recovery there thereafter but by and large right the stock is down huge and it has been crashing it's down 37 percent over the month and so we're going to get into the details of what has caused that crash now, one interesting thing here is that the stock did put in quite a recovery in the after hours on Friday. So I'd be interested to know what has caused that jump. My suspicion is that there were one of the directors that has put in a large order for shares um, to try and capitalize on this recent dip. Now, in terms of what was the cause of that initial drop, it's all to do with the release of this trading update for the three months to 30th of November 2021 where Boohoo have come out and said that their sales growth was not as strong as that they were anticipating. Um, and they're also now guiding for lower growth going forward for the next couple of quarters. So we'll get into the details of that. So management have noted here that the poor performance is as a consequence of significantly higher return rates impacting net sales growth and costs with continued disruption to our international delivery proposition impacting international demand and significant ongoing pandemic related cost inflation. Now, the pandemic related cost inflation is something that I think we're all aware of by now. And effectively, every single retailer, particularly in the fashion industry, is, is being impacted by this. So I'm not all that surprised. And I'm actually, for one, not all that concerned by this sort of inflation for retailers. I do think that it will subside with time. And as a long term investor, I can have that longer horizon and therefore not be concerned. However, there are a couple of things to note here, right? They are seeing significantly higher return rates. Now that is never good for a business because that means that people are receiving products and they're not happy with them. And naturally that will mean that they are going to return the product, which means a loss of sale at the point of time. But not only that, if customers continue to receive products that they are not happy with, then eventually they are going to leave and, and go to an alternative retailer. So that is not good as well. And we really need to dig into the detail of what is causing that higher return rate. And then the second point here is that they are seeing continued disruption to their international delivery proposition impacting international demand. And the reason for that is because they are seeing higher lead times on delivering their items to their international customers. And the reason for that is because they are all being shipped out of their UK distribution center. So clearly they need to improve on their distribution centers, get those set up over in the US, and therefore their lead times will reduce and presumably their demand will return to sort of more normalized levels. So just to give you an idea of some numbers, they achieved revenues of 506 million pounds. And you compare that to a year ago of 460 million pounds, that is a 10% year over year growth rate, right? Which isn't terrible, but when you're looking at a business that we're used to seeing grow by 30 and even 40%, and actually the valuation previously suggested that they need to be growing at 30 and 40 percent therefore a 10 percent growth rate it, you know it's not sufficient it's not adequate and as a result the stock price has fallen so we can see here that net sales impacted by return rates that are 12 and a half percentage points higher than last year and seven percentage points higher than pre-pandemic level levels driven by an exceptionally high dress mix. So clearly Boohoo have got an issue with either the quality of the dresses that they are providing or the perception of the dress that people believe that they were buying in comparison to what they actually received. Either way, it's not a good sign for the business. And that is actually a little bit of a concern for me personally, right? As a business, you want as many people as possible to be buying their products and keeping them. If they are having to return products, not only is that a loss of revenue, it's, a, it's an increased cost to the business, and not only that, of course, uh, there's an increased chance of that customer no longer returning because they're simply not happy with the product that they've received. And then coming back to what I was saying earlier, that their international performance across the group's brands and markets are impacted by significantly longer customer delivery times as a result of the pandemic, with all of our international sales currently fulfilled from our UK distribution network which is obviously not a good thing, right? However, we do know that Boohoo are already working to rectify this issue with the group continuing to invest in building a distribution network capable of supporting in excess of £5 billion of net sales with our first US distribution centre expected to go live in 2023. And we are considering options to expedite this process. Now, for me, I think it's important that they do put something in place in order to expedite this process because 2023, right, is, is quite a while away. And if we're going to see continued sort of um, depression in the growth of their sales in the US, then that's going to be a problem, right? And actually they might lose their opportunity to capitalize on the strong growth that they've already seen so far. So I would be disappointed if it does take until 2023 to go live, 
Uh, but at this point in time, that's what we had to use um, as our basis. Management then go on to give us some guidance for the full financial year. And we can see that for the year ending 28th of February 2022, the group now expects net sales growth to be 12 to 14 percent compared to previous guidance of 20 to 25 percent. So that is a huge reduction in, in their total net sales, especially when we are only one quarter away um, from that year end. So that is a, it's a massive slash in their growth. And as a result of that, we've seen a significant drop in the share price. But it's not just all about revenue, right? And as I alluded to earlier, their costs have been increasing as well. And so we can see here that adjusted EBITDA margin for the year is expected to be between 6 and 7% compared to previous guidance of 9 to 9.5% implying adjusted EBITDA between 117 and 139 million pounds. So that is a significant reduction in uh, adjusted EBITDA. And so clearly that's an issue as well. So not only are they seeing reduced growth in their revenues, but also their profitability is reducing as well. Now I'm not massively concerned about this again, because every single retailer that I've been seeing have been seeing a reduction in their margins. And I do think that most of these issues will be short term with the exception of the fact, or with, with a sort of caveat in there that if they continue to see a high level of returns, which in my opinion is not pandemic related, um, then that's going to be an issue for the business going forward. And we just need to keep an eye on that. With that being said, adjusted EBITDA of £140 million for a business that is valued at around £1.5 billion is actually not too bad at all, particularly when it's a, a business that is generally very high growing, right? So adjusted EBITDA to enterprise value in that case would be around 11. Now, of course, it is important to understand the difference between adjusted EBITDA and reported EBITDA. But when I've looked at the reconciliation between the two, there's a little bit of share-based compensation in there, but actually it's not too bad, right? And so the differences aren't that significant, at least compared with a lot of reconciliations that we see for high growing companies, right? So I'm, I'm actually projecting for reported EBITDA of around 100 million pounds for February 2022, which whilst is lower than what we saw in 2021, given how much that the share price has fallen, actually shows some pretty good value. So that would put us at an adjusted, or rather a reported EBITDA to enterprise value multiple of 15, which we'll come to see is incredibly low in terms of how much that this company generally trades for. So this chart here shows us the enterprise value to EBITDA multiples that Boohoo has been trading at over the last three years. And we can see that the average of those is 29.4. It says here that it's currently trading at 10, but actually I think that that is somewhat inaccurate because it doesn't uh, take into account, or it, it is inaccurate, right? Because it doesn't take into account the most recent guidance that we've seen. And that I believe that the sort of EBITDA that we're expecting for the full year now is around 100 million pounds. Even still though, that puts us at a sort of enterprise value to EBITDA multiple of 15, which is half uh, of, of the historical average over the last three years. So I still think that you're seeing good value here, but I don't think that this is trading at a 10 times enterprise value to EBITDA multiple. When we're taking into consideration what management has said, the results are likely to be for February 2022. So following on from the trading update, I have updated my personal valuation for the business to try and see whether there was still some value there, right? So as a result of that, I have gone for 2022 revenue to be just shy of £2 billion, and that is growth of just 12%. Now remember that management came out and said that they were expecting growth of between 12 and 14%, and therefore that falls right in line with that. Given there's only one quarter left, I think we can have a high degree of accuracy that that is going to be correct. I'll just point you in the direction of the compounded annual growth rate over the last five years, it's actually been 55%. Management has said that once the sort of short-term issues subside, they expect to get back to growth rates of between 25 and 30%, right? With that being said, we're going for 12% revenue growth in year one before the business returns back to some more slightly normal revenue growth figures of 20% year over year for the next four years. And then following that for year six to 10, we're looking at revenue growth of 15%. Gross margins have actually remained relatively consistent across the entire period. And I've gone with an average of 54%, which is an average of the last four years. And I've projected that going forward. I'm actually expecting gross margins in 2022 to probably be slightly lower than 54%. And I'm expecting later years to be slightly higher than 54%. But given that I don't think that there's going to be a significant amount of fluctuation there, I've gone with 54% across the board. I think over the time period of 10 years is what I'm looking at. I think that that's going to be reasonable. Operating expenses, I have gone with 47% as well, which again is in line with a sort of historical averages. Once again, I'm expecting operating expenses to be slightly higher in the near term, slightly lower uh, in the long term. Again, I think over a period of 10 years, that will all normalise out.
And then we've got weighted average cost of capital of 12.4%. At the end of all of that, we're expecting revenues to be eight billion pounds in 10 years time, compared with 1.8 billion pounds now. So significant amount of growth, but at the end of the day, they do have a track record of doing this. And with the expansion into the US, and once they get that US distribution center set up, I think that that is more than reasonable. And we come down to profit. We're actually looking at net profit margins of 5.5% uh, and net profit of £451 million. Once again, I think that that's reasonable. And that 5.5% net profit margin is actually lower than what they generally achieve historically. So I'm more than comfortable that that is, is definitely achievable. And then coming on to the discounted cash flow, you can see that their average EBITDA margin is around 9%. I'm actually saying that they are going to achieve margins of 5% for year one, 7% for year two before finally in 2024 getting back to those normalized figures of somewhere between eight and a half and nine percent margins now in terms of free cash flow in the most recent year they didn't actually post free cash flow and that's because they posted significant amount of acquisitions such as the acquisition of debenhams so it's quite difficult to gauge something so what sort of acquisitions they're going to be making in the future and how that's going to impact their free cash flow but i've gone with unlevered free cash flow as a percentage of ebitda as 45 percent on average over the period now that I think is quite conservative actually, but I do believe that this is a business that is going to have to continue to acquire businesses um, and put down a lot of capital expenditures in order to build out that infrastructure. And therefore I think 45% on average over the sort of 10 year period is probably fair. Now in terms of the intrinsic value that we get as a result of that, we get a fair value per share of £1.60. Now that's a mix of £1.43 from the discounted cash flow and £1.76 from the earnings multiple model based on a PE ratio in 10 years time of 16. Now in terms of why I think that 16 is a fair PE ratio to apply to this business in 10 years time, well, it comes down to a couple of things. The first one being the fact that Boohoo has always traded at a premium. So if you have a look that actually the business has traded at a, an average historical PE ratio of somewhere between 40 and 60. So I'm dropping that by a significant amount and that gives me a lot of comfort. The second reason is what kind of P ratio would we attribute to its competitors? One of those, for example, being ASOS. And I would actually put a higher P ratio to ASOS, despite the fact that it's a slower growing business. And the reason for that is because I think that it's slightly safer in terms of its business model. The reason I say that is because with ASOS, it sells the products of not only its own products, but also products of different brands as well. Whereas Boohoo relies on, on its own made brands. And as a result of that, I think that if demand for Boohoo's products uh, obviously go down, then that's going to significantly impact the business, whereas ASOS sort of have the hedge in that they also sell the products of, of other brands as well. Now, you could quite easily make a rational argument that Boohoo should have a higher P ratio than ASOS for reasons such as uh, higher growth in terms of revenue growth, but also higher margins. And that would be fair as well. It all comes down to your personal preference at the end of the day. Ultimately, we get a fair value of £1.60 per year, and that's a 33% margin of safety. Now, in terms of what I think that my 2026 price target for the business is based on an enterprise value to EBITDA multiple, I'm applying an enterprise value to EBITDA multiple of 12, which is obviously less than half of the average multiple that we saw earlier on. We get a, a 2025 price target of £3.35, which would be a compounded annual growth rate of 23%. So even still remaining fairly conservative in our multiples, we get a significant upside year over year, which would obviously be very, very good. All of this, of course, is contingent on them returning back to some historical norms in terms of their margins, but them also returning to a more sort of historical norm in terms of their revenue growth. Both things at the moment are obviously in doubt, and the reason, and, and effectively that is reflected in the current share price at just £1.20, right? So there aren't many businesses that you could apply some relatively rational and conservative um, sort of assumptions to uh, and arrive at a margin of safety of 33%. But that's reflected in the, in the uncertainty in the model. Anyway, guys, I hope you've enjoyed the video and until next time, thank you.